Hey, wonderful. Hi, everyone. Um, it is so wonderful to be here. Good evening. Big, big welcome. And thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today. We have a great, great event ahead of us and a tremendous panel of speakers. My name is Bianca Mageni. I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, which is one of the organizations that is presenting this event tonight. We have simultaneous translation um, for today's event from English to French. Um, you can find out more about that in the chat. We'll be posting information about that um, throughout the event. Nous avons une traduction simultanée d'anglais vers le français. Si vous souhaitez écouter en français, cliquez sur l'icône interprétation de langue qui devrait être visible en bas de votre écran. L'icône est un globe terrestre comme comme le monde. The icon is a globe like the world. Um, les instructions seront the publiées plusieurs fois dans le chat. Si vous avez problème, contactez Brandon Stone. Contact uh, Stone please. Please. Vous indiquez dans le chat. And uh, we'll give you information about that in the chat. So please follow. So before Marie, we... si vous pouvez, si vous pouvez changer uh, le channel en français, s'il vous plaît. Merci Marie. Merci Marie. Okay, so before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that um, many of us are gathered here today on Indigenous land. And today I'm, um, I'm speaking to you from Montreal, Jage, which is situated on the traditional territory of the Ganyangihaga, a place where um, that has long served as a site of meaning, meeting and exchange among many First Nations. Um, I just want to recognize the Ghanaiyangi Haga as the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on. I also want to thank our co-sponsors, the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War, who've been leading the charge World Beyond War, the Canadian Peace Congress, Just Peace Advocates, as well as our media sponsor, Canada Files. And it's, it's amazing to see this turnout. There's so many of us here. Um, and I mean, many thanks to the National Post and the Conservative Party for all their free publicity. Um, so we're live streaming to Facebook as well. So let your friends know that they can watch live um, at facebook.com slash worldbeyondwar um, or on the Canada Files Facebook page. And again, those links are in the chat. So um, even if they haven't registered, they can watch the event live. Also, we really want to focus, um, as always, with these events that we do on the different ways that people can take action. Um, so I'll be talking a lot more about ways that people can actually get involved and active right at the end, so, so stay till then. The chat's now open um, and we look forward to hearing from you at home. We know there's lots of opinions um, and we, we're excited to see that exchange of ideas here. Um, we just have the very basic request that people keep their comments. Civil, racist, sexist comments will not be tolerated. Hateful, harmful comments will not be uh, tolerated. They're not welcome and we will have to remove anyone not respecting this. So again, my name is Bianca Magenyi. I'm here representing the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, which challenges unjust foreign policy measures uh, and aims to bridge the gap between the perception and the reality of Canada's role in the world. And you can find out more about us at uh, foreignpolicy.ca. Um, so for tonight's event, we're gonna be hearing from our panelists and then we're gonna be moving on to a Q&A first with any interested journalists, and then we'll be taking questions from the audience. So please post your questions in the chat. So why are we holding this event today? Uh, we're holding this event because we're deeply concerned about deteriorating relations between Canada and China. And this unfortunate direction is made clear by the wild reactions that we're seeing from um, conservative MPs like uh, MP Raquel Dancho, who took a minute at Parliament yesterday to recall, to call this event uh, Chinese party propaganda. The backlash is real. Reporters have even asked us, um, asked organizers if we're receiving funding from the Chinese government, while the National Post called us, and I quote, useful idiots on the, on the front page. Um, so that's the stage. Um, and before we begin, I just want to start with some background. Um, two years ago, uh, Meng Wanzhou, CFO of Huawei Technologies, was arrested um, with the foreknowledge of Prime Minister Trudeau at the Vancouver airport. The circumstances around her arrest were strange, irregular. 
Um, Mong's personal electronic devices and passcodes were seized and transferred by the RCMP to the FBI. Meng was not arrested for any crime she committed in Canada. Rather, her arrest for fraud was requested by the US government based on allegations that her company, Huawei, had been involved in violating US economic sanctions on Iran. Prior to arriving in Vancouver, Meng had traveled through six countries uh, with US extradition tr treaties that did not arrest her, but Canada did. Shortly after her arrest, Trump made it abundantly clear that this arrest was political. And he said that he intended to use Meng as a bargaining chip in his trade war with China. So for almost two years, Meng Wanzhou has been subject to house arrest. The possible sentence that she might face if found guilty is up to 150 years in jail. Canada's arrest of Meng Wanzhou has been subject, um, has, 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 it really has had unfortunate political, economic and social consequences already. Right? We're seeing the loss of Chinese markets for Canada and a spike in Sinophobia. I also want to um, highlight the racial, the racial dimension for a minute. Um, in criticizing the event yesterday, um, uh, Conservative Shadow Minister for Diversity, uh, Raquel Dancho said, all Canadian MPs need to stand with our Five Eyes partners and like-minded allies to push back on Beijing's intimidation techniques. The Five Eyes Intelligence Arrangement, which consists of Canada, the US, uh, New Zealand, Australia, and Britain, is quite frankly stoking conflict with Huawei and China. And, you know, what is the five, a five Eyes that we hear endlessly about regarding China? Is it a solidarity network for European settler states? It's no coincidence that the only four countries that originally voted against the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples under, are part of the Five Eyes. What connects the Five Eyes? Where I was born in Uganda, for instance, there's probably more English speakers than there are in New Zealand. So why isn't it a part of the Five Eyes? Or India, or Nigeria, or why not wealthier countries like Japan and South Korea? I think this is something that we should reflect on. Um, Tonight's panel discussion is really about Canada and the subservient role um, that the Trudeau government is playing to the US in arresting Meng Wanzhou and the many, many unfortunate consequences that have ensued. Uh, when the Trump administration convinced the Trudeau government to arrest Meng Wanzhou, the US dragged Canada contrary to its national interest into what is increasingly becoming a new cold war with China. The world doesn't need conflict between the US, Canada, and China. What we need is international cooperation more than ever to deal with the global crises, the global pandemic and the climate crisis. Hostage diplomacy, um, as many of our panelists have already said, is a terrible thing. Let's get Hmong released and the two Michaels to their families. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first Esteemed panelist, our first panelist is John Philpot. Uh, John Philpot is a Canadian criminal defense attorney and expert in international criminal law. He has 35 years experience as a lawyer, activist and speaker in the international peace movement in Canada, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East and Asia. Welcome, John. You just need to unmute yourself. How's that? Very good. So um, I'd like to thank the people who have organized this conference. It's a very important conference. And I will move on directly to the issues since we have a lot of esteemed speakers today. Um, extradition is simple. Someone is accused of murder in the States. They provide the end and there are persons in Canada, they send an indictment, they ask Canada to issue a warrant, they send a summary of the evidence, and if the same crime exists in Canada, like murder, it's relatively routine that the person be surrendered to the US. The minister, and it's very important for you to remember this, has a role at the beginning any time during the process and at the end if ever the court rules that the person could be surrendered. Let's not forget this. Now, 
we hear a lot about the rule of law, but in fact, what we're looking, seeing more is the rule of lies. We, uh, Bianca, Bianca mentioned that um, they had six or eight countries. The indictment was issued in August 2018 after a long process where China had, US had been planning to try and find something against uh, Huawei. Between August and December 1st, she visited Britain, Ireland, Japan, France, Poland, and Belgium, all of whom have extradition treaties with the US. But they chose, Trump and the US government chose their vassal, Justin Trudeau. And Justin Trudeau knew about this a few days before it happened. What is the charge? The charge is, misleading HSBC um, about some kind of representations, which would amount to a fraud in violation of US sanctions law in, 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 in force in that period of 2013, 2014. Now, what happened? On the 30th, the judge issued a, a warrant, a, an arrest for her, uh, a warrant for her arrest. When you have a warrant for arrest to arrest somebody, it says arrest the person immediately. It's a, it's a criminal, right? Or a, a fugitive criminal. But the Canadian Border Services and the RCMP met the night before and the morning before, and they decided not to arrest immediately. They had a, another plan. The Border Services would question her and for all of you who go through customs, they can ask you any questions, they can search your computer, they can search your phone, they can take you aside and you don't have a right to counsel. You're not under arrest. And so what they did is they spent almost three hours with her from what I understand, and they managed to get some material from her. They got codes, uh, the passwords for his, her electronic devices. They took pictures of the serial numbers on her phone and electronic devices. They put her devices in, I think it's called a Faraday bag, but it's a bag which is lead, covered with lead, so it cannot be uh, erased or in any way. And then they passed it on to the RCMP after two and a half hours after questioning her. And this would have a lot of Huawei material, presumably, in her computer, which is not related to 2013, it's modern. Anyway, and the, um, the uh, testimony of one of the uh, border services people said, oh, I made a terrible mistake. I gave my, the numbers, the codes to the RCMP. Was he punished for making this kind of mistake? I don't think so. So this is the first part of the flaw or the in the government case, we can add to that, there is a senior RCMP officer named Ben Chang, who refused to testify. Apparently he's in China or, or um, working in, um, I forgot the name of the, the former Portuguese colony. He's working there, uh, but just part of China now. And he refused to testify and the evidence that we have on him is that he informed his colleagues that the devices had been sent to the RCMP, to the FBI. So he doesn't want to testify. This is a very, very serious problem. And this abusive process by extorting by trick material from her is the grounds of an abusive process application. Abusive process is difficult in Canadian law, but possible. And this is an example where it should be granted. And so this is one access, one side of the defense. The second uh, important part of the defense is the following. When they provide evidence or a summary of evidence uh, to justify the case for which she should be taken because she allegedly help to try and get induce HSBC to commit fraud. 
they sent a series of slides of her meetings with senior authorities in uh, Hong Kong and the company, which is her sort of subsidiary, Sky, it's the name, the last name of it, Sky. But the evidence which the US provided was incomplete. And slides, I think, six and 16 of this, uh, that which she had explained to the HSBC, were admitted. So the defense has applied to bring in evidence in the extradition process. Evidence is um, exceptionally, but it's been admitted. So the judge has made a ruling which potentially could allow a uh, giveaway out to the uh, uh, defense and have her not extradited um, because the evidence may not be sufficient and it may be a lie because sufficiency of evidence is a criteria for extradition. So that's kind of the basic parameters of the criminal case. There's many deeper aspects to it. For example, um, the meetings and the exchanges with the RCMP and the FBI have not been admitted in court. And that's a serious problem because they had been planning because Canada was doing the, the dirty work for the US. The judge also, Heather Holmes, made a very bad judgment on double criminality because what she, she tried to say, and the federal government and the US in, argued in court that this is a form of fraud because they induced someone which could be in trouble because of US uh, uh, sanctions on Iran. This is a way of bringing in the extraterritoriality of um, US law. And the judge said, well, this is anal analogous to fraud. Um, I think it's wrong. And it does allow, uh, and she made a very outrageous statement, which is extra, this crime defined by US law is not as bad as slavery. You can find the judgment. It was in March, no, May last year. So she's been very uh, uh, retrograde on that issue. And this will be a ground of uh, appeal if ever this is granted. Just so you know, the, court, the hearing is going on now. I urge you to follow it. Um, Proctor underscore Jason has some good stuff on Twitter. Um, Cyrus Jansen, J-A-N-S-S-E-N, has a YouTube channel which follows this very closely. You all have brains. There's 100, 246 people. You all have what it's needed to understand. And I urge you to follow this and because this could be an, a long going fight. One comment, the US and Canada should watch out because I remember in, I know the story about October, 1950, when they thought they were gonna march up to Korea, Southern China into Russia. And suddenly General MacArthur got a shock and they said, no. And we all know about the Korean War and the, uh, they were stopped. So we do not want this to turn to war. We want this to turn to multilateral uh, relationships. I'm not gonna talk about the politics very much because we have eminent people with us who uh, understand these issues better than I do. All the economic issues are extremely important. And thank you very much for, uh, to the organizer of this seminar for uh, a chance to air these issues based on knowledge. And you can all understand that, thank you. Thank you so much, John, um, you know, just for detailing all of this, the legal elements, international law, and, um, you know, just the ramifications that this really has. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more from you um, during the conversation at the end, the Q&A. Our next speaker is KJ No. Uh, KJ No is a longtime journalist, political analyst, writer, activist, teacher, specializing in the geopolitics of the Asia Pacific region. Welcome, KJ. Thank you so much. I'm very honored to be here with everybody. 
I'm going to start out with a little bit of history, and I'm sharing my screen right now as we speak. Uh, this is an image uh, from October 20, uh, around October 1930. So on October 24th, 1930, a mother with young children was kidnapped, and she was the cherished wife of an important leader. The plan of the kidnappers was that by kidnapping her, this would create unbearable psychological pressure on her husband. KG, I'm so her. sorry to interrupt, but we can't see your screen right now. Can you try sharing it again? Sorry for the interruption. That's can great, KJ. Now we can see it. Thank you. Okay. So, this is the the uh, the mother. She's a mother with young children, and the idea is by kidnapping her, this will create unbearable psychological pain and force uh, this person. Uh, the leader, the husband, to capitulate. Um, many decades after this, uh, the husband uh, writes a poem in her memory. Of course, the kidnapping goes wrong, and she is uh, tortured and eventually is killed. So he writes a poem in her memory. Uh, this is the poem, and uh, it's a very touching uh, uh, poem. Of course, the poet was Chairman Mao, Mao Zedong. And Could you speak up a little bit? Your voice is a little muffled. The, the person who wrote the poem was Chairman Mao. And the woman who was kidnapped was Yang Kai Hui, his first wife. This was the love of his life. And Mao never forgave his kidnappers for their cowardice, their depravity, the misogyny, victimizing women and children as weapons in a war. And he ground his enemies far away, drove them into the sea. And then he built a state where such things could not happen again. She is part of Chinese history. This is a postage stamp memorializing her. This is Meng Wanzhou. As you can see, she's also a mother of young children. And globally, this state-directed extraterritorial kidnapping of Meng Wanzhou is seen in a similar light. It's an act of infamy, misogyny, and thuggery. The Chinese government has proclaimed it is lawless, reasonless, ruthless, extremely vicious. The Chinese government is not given to these kinds of statements. Now, she's, most people understand she's not guilty of anything, but she has been kidnapped as a pawn. Donald Trump has said Meng Wanzhou is a bargaining chip. Now, the International Convention Against the Taking of Hostages says that any person who seizes or detains a person to compel a state to do an act as an explicit or implicit condition commits the offense of hostage taking. The outcome of this judicial kidnapping will determine U.S., Canada, China policy for decades to come. I want to point out that what is on trial, who is on trial, is not Meng Wanzhou. It is the judicial system of Canada and the conscience, good sense, and ethics of its executive and ruling class. If the Canadian judiciary and its ruling classes fail this test, Canada risks becoming an international pariah. It's almost as if it is going to drive itself into the sea. The key facts is the Canadian government arrested Meng as she was transiting Vancouver on a flight. 
the charge was made by the U.S. District Court's Eastern District of New York. The original charge was fraud and conspiracy to commit fraud regarding U.S. sanctions on Iran. As uh, John has already pointed out, the Canadians do not subscribe to sanctions against Iran. Canada encourages trade with Iran. Business dealings with Iran are not a crime in Canada. And U.S. sanctions are actually a violation of international law. Also, Canada's requirement of double criminality, the crime has to be a crime in both jurisdictions, otherwise you cannot extradite. Let me repeat, trade with Iran is not a crime. The sanctions are illegal. So the US concocted a case. They said she'd lied to a bank, she must be extradited for fraud. Now the bank was HSBC, the crime happened in Hong Kong, the accused was a Chinese national, and the arrest was in a Canadian transit zone. That sounds like the beginning of a bad joke. She was extradited, she must be extradited to the US for fraud. The question is who was defrauded of how much? What was the harm from this fraud? Nobody has answered this. The other question is why does the US even have the standing to charge fraud? The US claimed it had standing because transactions with HSBC had or would have transited US servers in New York for a few milliseconds due to electronic dollar transfer and clearance systems. Now, even if the allegations were true, this would be a private matter between HSBC and Long. The funds could have gone through an alternate system bypassing New York, and no non-US person has ever been charged for causing a non-US bank to violate US sanctions in the past. Now, as we pointed out, it was the adoption was attempted in six other countries, uh, and HSBC was already under prosecution by the US government for prior violations. So it probably decided to collaborate to entrap Hmong. The arrest itself involved abuses of process that John has mentioned, including hiding of exculpatory documents, denial of key access to key documents, violation of charter rights. These are the missing slides. You can see that there is no lying. It says Huawei conducts normal business activities in Iran, provides civilian telecommunications. It says that Huawei uh, engagement with Skycom is normal and controllable business cooperation. This will not change in the future. Where is the lie? Okay. So is it fraud? Fraud is lying plus harm. That is to say, there has to be deliberate misrepresentation as well as harm or risk of harm to HSBC. That is, it must be at risk for fines or penalties for sanctions busting. But if Hmong had lied to the bank, there would be no harm because HSBC cannot be held liable as an innocent party if it had been deceived into breaching sanctions. If Hmong didn't lie, then there was no fraud. So documents, slides released show that HSBC had been informed of the relationship. There was no deception. There was no lie, no harm, no fraud. Case dismissed. Okay. Remember, double criminality, Canada does not have sanctions against Iran. Justice Heather Holmes ruled against Hmong. She said, don't look for correspondence between the statutes. We need to transpose the context and environment of the statutes in the demanding country to render a decision. In other words, we have to interpret the demand for extradition by transposing the environment that led the US to make the demand. Canada has no sanctions, but you have to imagine as if Canada had sanctions on Iran to render the decision. In other words, the illegal environment of US sanctions overruled the clear letter of Canadian law. In other words, Justice Heather Holmes installed an illegal sanctions into Canada by installing an illegal backdoor. Okay, dangerous precedent. Any country could be interpreted on the basis of local environment. This leads to an end of double criminality. 
This makes a mockery of Canada's own laws and sovereignty. It's a subjugation of Canada to U.S. extraterritoriality. And it's a corrupt, consequential, and deeply catastrophic judgment. I spoke to a judge, retired Superior Court judge in the United States, in California, and she says that it is the greatest contortion of logic that she has heard. And people like to say that Canada is just doing this as a rule of law by the books action. But remember, Maha Ara and many other people were rendered and tortured. Uh, and he was innocent of all charges. He was kidnapped illegally through the assistance of the RCMP. Those of you who don't know should look up what a Saskatoon Starlight tour is. It's a habit that the RCMP have of kidnapping indigenous people and then abandoning them where they're sure to die of hypothermia in the winter. And of course, we all know the Canadian government has kidnapped tens of thousands of indigenous children, sometimes at gunpoint, and forced them into residential schools. This was genocide and kidnapping through rule of law, of course. The UN has published a long series of findings on Canada. Uh, the Canadian government has also been known to fight tooth and nail to harbor war criminals and tortures, people who legitimately should be extradited. So we have to ask ourselves, why is the US doing this? Why is Canada involved? And why are we having this hybrid war. Now, Canada has been designated an enemy. This is geek speak, wonk speak for, uh, for uh, revisionist powers, the geek speak for official enemy. And this goes back to US history. This actually is a neocon project going back to the 1992 defense planning guidance document, the 1997 project for a new American century, and then the Bush Doctrine, air sea battle in 2010, Pacific pivot in 2011, and 2018, the national security strategy. That designates China as an official enemy. The U.S. is at war with China. It involves economic war, technological war, legal warfare, diplomatic warfare, military brinksmanship, civil subversion, academic warfare, and information warfare. U.S. hybrid warfare against Huawei consists of tech war, trade war, uh, supply chain strangulation, economic warfare, lawfare, including this judicial kidnapping, and cyber war. Okay. The question we need to ask ourselves is, did Canadian citizens connect, consent to this war? If so, when and where was this debated? And Huawei is also a problem because it disrupts the electronic panopticon. A worldwide Huawei system would create problems for the US global surveillance system. Um, Huawei's allegations of spying have been completely debunked. The German intelligence, British intelligence, US NSA have found that there has been no spying. Okay. On the other hand, Huawei refuses to plant back doors. They said that Huawei has not, will never plant back doors. And Wired has says that uh, Huawei is also an obstacle to NSA surveillance. Bloomberg alleged that Huawei had uh, created telnet connections that were insecure, but Vodafone refuted these allegations. It's completely implausible. Huawei refutes these allegations, demands proof. The proof is never coming. Okay. So we have to step back from the brink. We have to back off on the unsubstantiated lies and allegations of unverifiable backdoor spying, stop the spying and harassment of Huawei, stop the projection, stop the interference with its global contracts, stop the fraudulent prosecution, prosecutions, stop taking hostages. This is a violation of international law and Canada must release Meng Wanzhou find ways to repair relations, find ways to cooperate anew with China.
the benefits will be tangible and immense. The consequences will be immeasurable. And nobody who tells you that Canada's hands are legally tied is telling you the truth. Canada has the right and moral duty to refuse extradition. Section 23 of the Canadian Extradition Act gives the government the authority to terminate this case at any time by abdicating its responsibilities to the Canadian people and the cause of justice, the Trudeau administration is doing an incredible harm to Canada and to the people of the world. Okay. People are suffering. More people will suffer. We have to end the kidnapping now. Thank you. Thank you so much, KJ, um, for that really brilliant presentation um, for giving us the history that I think a lot of people don't know um, and showing us how people in China would see this historically, um, the extra extraterritoriality of the US and also just for reminding us that our hands are not tied as Canada. So our next speaker of the evening is MP Paul Manley. Paul Manley serves as the member of parliament um, for Nanaimo Ladysmith. Um, Paul is a member of the Green Party of Canada and was elected to the House of Commons in 2019, making him the second elected Green federal MP in, in Canadian history. He's also the party's foreign critic. Um, Paul is a filmmaker and a former director on the national board of the Council of Canadians. Welcome, Paul. Well, thank you for having me. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you from the traditional unceded territory of this Nanaimo First Nation. I'd like to thank the organizers for hosting this discussion. To start, I want to say that my main concern is with the release of Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig and putting an end to hostage diplomacy. That is my reason for speaking out on this issue, issue and the reason I agreed to participate in this panel discussion. I think the name of this event is unfortunate. It doesn't reflect the complexity of the situation or my position on it. <clears throat> Anyone who knows my background, advocacy and work in the House of Commons knows that I'm also very concerned about human rights in China, the persecution of Uyghurs and pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong, the Chinese surveillance state and the Canada-China FIPA agreement. In July, 2020, the Green Party caucus put out a statement we called on the federal government to demand that the United States drop criminal charges against Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou and withdraw its extradition request so that Canada can release her. We did this because we want to see the release of Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig. That was and remains my position. Canada cannot unilaterally release Meng Wanzhou. Canada is a signatory to extradition treaties with the United States and a number of other countries. These treaties have the force of law behind them and need to be respected. There should be no political interference in that process. US, Donald, US President Donald Trump is key to everything that has happened with Meng Wanzhou. His actions led directly to Michael Spavor or Michael Kovrig being jailed in China. The Trump administration abused the trust of the Canadian authorities and abused international diplomatic norms. The timing of Meng Wanzhou's arrest in Vancouver was telling. It occurred right before a trade meeting between President Trump and President Xi at the G20 in Buenos Aires. To quote former Crown prosecutor and prominent media commentator, Sandy Garasino, what could be a better pressure tactic in trade talks than to orchestrate a surprise glorified perp walk on the global stage? Meng's arrest wasn't important, necessary, or urgent. It was a show, end quote. Indeed, just days after her arrest, President Trump made a remark about using Meng as a bargaining trip chip in trade negotiations. This was not the first or the last time that Trump acted in an irresponsible and dangerous manner. He has regularly ignored international norms of diplomacy, evidence, and multilateralism. As a result, Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig are sitting in a Chinese jail with no end to their ordeal in sight. The pretense employed to arrest Meng Wanzhou was that she misled HSBC and placed the bank at risk of violating US sanctions against Iran, and that Huawei had violated those sanctions. Those unilateral sanctions imposed by the Trump administration were bogus from the beginning. In 2015, 
during the Obama administration, Iran, China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, Germany, and the United States ratified the Iran nuclear deal. During his election campaign, Trump vowed to tear it up. In March 2018, the director of the International Atomic Energy Agency reported that Iran is implementing its nuclear-related commitments. The deal was working. The Trump administration wanted changes to the Iran nuclear deal, made accusations of non-compliance, and ultimately imposed the unilateral sanctions. These are the sanctions that Huawei was accused of violating and Hmong was accused of putting HSBC at risk of violating. It's fair to say that Donald Trump has dedicated much of his presidency to undoing the work of President Obama. Trump imposed sanctions on Iran because he didn't like the nuclear, Iran nuclear deal that Obama had helped broker. Canada does not have sanctions against Iran. And the European Union blocked its citizens and corporations from complying with the UN, with the US sanctions. It's important to point out that historically, it has always been corporations that have been charged in connection with sanctions violations, not individual corporate executives. This all may, also makes the Meng Wanzhou case unusual. It's my hope that the incoming Biden administration will return to multilateralism, drop the charges against Meng Wanzhou and withdraw the extradition request. It's the only way for her to be released in accordance with international norms and the rule of law and it does not require the U.S. to drop its charges against Huawei. I also hope that the new U.S. administration will recommit to the Iran nuclear deal and drop the sanctions imposed by Trump. Nothing I have said here should be interpreted as, as giving the government of the public, People's Republic of China a free pass. I am deeply concerned about the persecution of Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities in China, and I reject any assertion that this is not happening. I trust the Amnesty International reports on this issue. I am concerned about the treatment of pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong and mainland China. I share the concerns raised by Noam Chomsky and Edward Snowden about the Chinese surveillance state. I think there are good reasons to have concerns about the use of Huawei technology in Canada and the implications of the anti-democratic Canada-China FIPA agreement is an issue I've been raising for years and something that all Canadians should be concerned about. Canada is caught between two bullies, the Trump administration and the government of the People's Republic of China. We are the pawns in this geopolitical chess match and two of our citizens are suffering the consequences. We need to stand up to both of these bullies. As I said at the beginning, our extradition treaty is important and must be respected. We don't often hear about extradition proceedings in the news, but if you do a Google search, you will find examples of extradition cases for murderers, rapists, and embezzlers who have robbed people of their savings. The victims in these cases deserve to have their, their, accusers, their accused perpetrators brought to justice in Canada. There should be no political interference in our extradition process. The courts must decide these cases. Opening a path to a diplomatic solution that will lead to the release of Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig is my overriding concern here today. This is what we offered in our caucus statement, and it should not be confused with support for a unilateral release of Meng Wanzhou. Others on this panel may disagree with that position. That's fine. It's good to get out of our echo chamber. It's good to get out of our echo chambers and discuss and debate ideas and problems. In fact, it's essential for a strong democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul Manley. Um, I also just want to thank you for, um, you know, just making it here, you know, riding the storm and the backlash and, uh, and showing up. And, you know, thank you for letting us know what the Green Party position is um, and that Trump's, you know, Trump's policy of pushing back, uh, of pushing for, Ma for Meng's arrest is, is wrongheaded. So thank you for presenting that. And, uh, and also thank you for your clear-eyed recent uh, minute long uh, criticism of Canadian foreign policy in parliament, really appreciate it. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more from you in the Q and A. So our next speaker is Kathy Walker. 
Kathy Walker is the former National Health and Safety Director of the CAW, Canadian Auto Workers Union, now Unifor, um, where she was National Union Representative responsible for health, safety, environment since 1975. Since her retirement, she's been working to build understanding and solidarity between un the union movements of Canada and China. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you very much, uh, Bianca, and thanks very much to the organizers. And uh, thanks very much to Rachel for running these slides. Uh, my talk is about uh, labor solidarity with China's workers. Next slide, please. Uh, Harvard's Elaine Bernard and UCLA's Kent Wong, then uh, both heads of labor studies programs, had this to say. China has undergone tremendous change in the past few decades. In this context of change, would not more worker to worker and union to union exchange be positive? Through more dialogue with Chinese workers and unions, the labor movement could promote mutually beneficial labor solidarity, move beyond the Cold War and unilateralism, and refocus attention on the domestic and global corporations and associated institutions that are, in fact, the main threat to workers throughout the world. Next slide, please. Solidarity between Canadian and Chinese workers is important and has a decades long history. Next slide, please. Many labor delegations have gone back and forth, especially since China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001 and the integration of China with the world economy strengthened, much of it based on the exploitation of Chinese workers. Next slide. Here are but a few delegations as examples. Sharing experiences to promote friendship, mutual understanding and solidarity. For example, a formal agreement for exchanges between the BC Federation of Labor and the Shandong Provincial Federation of Trade Unions in 2013. In 2002, there was a delegation from the All China Federation of Trade Unions to Toronto. A return visit in, to China in 2004, three auto plants were visited in Beijing, Shanghai, and Tianjin. 2004, a return visit from Chinese unionists to Brampton Auto Assembly Plant. 2006, the Vancouver and District Labor Council visited Beijing. 2009, the ACFTU Health and Safety Delegation to the Canadian Labor Congress in Ottawa. The BC Federation of Labor and the Vancouver and District Labor Council visited in the summer of 2014. The Beijing Municipal Federation of Trade Unions visited in 2016, toured the BC Institute of Technology to see apprenticeship training. In 2017, Unifor visited unions in China. This is the Shandong Provincial Federation of Trade Unions. Unfortunately, these visits to learn about unions and workers in our two countries have ceased since Man Wanzhou was arrested in December of 2018. Friendly relations have become strained because of this harmful diplomatic issue. This obstacle should be removed. The Meng Wanzhou arrest has affected trade which has adversely affected Canadian workers' jobs. In farming, because of decreased sales of products such as canola oil. In transportation across Canada. By rail. By trucking. At Canadian ports. These are good Canadian jobs that have been adversely affected by the arrest and attempt to extradite we want these export related jobs restored. Since joining the WTO, Canadian high tech jobs have been lost with the closure of corporations such as Nortel. High tech jobs and job opportunities exist with Huawei. 1300 good high tech jobs are in Canada of Huawei. Will they be lost or will more come? In 1970, Canada had an independent foreign policy with respect to China. 
Canada was one of the very first Western powers to recognize China diplomatically. We should resume our independent foreign policy in the case of Meng Wanzhou. We know from books and movies that prisoner exchanges are common among countries. Why should this not be the case for Canada in the case of the two Michaels? This fall, the Hamilton and District Labour Council called for the release of Meng Wanzhou. The arrest of Meng Wanzhou has contributed to racism against Asian people in Canada. The labour movement is vehemently opposed to racism. We deplore hate crimes, discrimination and hostile actions against Asian people in Canada and the pandemic has made a bad situation worse. Racist attacks must be stopped. More than 600 cases have been reported this year with one third of them being physical assaults. Dozens of Richmond BC residents rallied against racism in May of 2020. The release of Meng Wanzhou will normalize relations between Canada and China, will contribute to a reduction in racism in Canada against Asians, will help to restore friendly relations and exchanges between Canadian and Chinese labor unions and workers. Thank you very much. Whoops, my bad, need to unmute. So thank you so much, Kathy, for just for making the connections, the working class connections and for reminding us um, about the racism as, uh, as well. Um, and for underscoring the need for Canada to have an independent foreign policy as well. Um, and look, looking very forward to hearing more from you during the Q&A. So our, uh, our next speaker um, of the evening is Atif Kubersi. Um, Atif Kabursi is a professor emeritus of economics at McMaster University. He's also president of Econom Econometric Research Limited. In 2006, he was appointed executive secretary to the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia. He's authored 12 books and has published extensively in the areas of macroeconomics, economic development strategies, international trade, impact analysis, and regional planning. Welcome, Atif. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bianca. Thank you for inviting me, uh, Ken, and uh, the group of the Hamilton Against the War. I am delighted to be here. Actually, uh, what I'm going to say is rooted in general economic theory and knowledge. Basically, in politics as in economics, a unipolar world, a monopolistic world, does not confer benefits to people and to countries. Actually, the opposite is true. There is a lot to be gained from increased participation, a multipolar world, a more competitive world, not a monopolistic world. It's also a tested proposition in economics that any party in a bargain on any relationship that does not have options is not likely to benefit from that relationship. The countries and the parties that benefit are those with options. And if countries or parties do not have options, they have to work on it. They have to strive to increase their options and increase their bargaining power. Canada's economy is heavily dependent on trade. Uh, it's the destiny of a small country with a small population, with a large, uh, huge space and a, an adverse climate. Uh, the, Trade in Canada is about 54% of GDP, is perhaps one of the largest, what we call foreign trade percentage, which is the sum of exports and imports divided by the gross domestic product. There are very few countries that have such a high percentage. It's understandable and quite reasonable for Canada and as part of its destiny uh, to trade. But why has Canada been so focused on trade and heavily dependent on one country. Yes, you need to trade, but why should you trade be so concentrated, so heavily dependent on being tied so heavily and so strongly to one country? Uh, trade, you know, in uh, China, 
is now the largest global economy. I mean, the, you would say in terms of nominal GDP is number two, but if you look at something which is far more uh, acceptable and reasonable, which we call it the purchasing power parity, not the US dollar expression, but what the dollar buys. And if you take this measure, uh, China is the largest economy. Even in nominal dollars, it's likely to be very quickly growing at the fastest rate of growth is likely to be the largest economy, even in nominal dollars, not only in person dollars. It is already since 2013, China is the largest trading country in the world. With a GDP of $14 trillion, it trades around $4.5 trillion. Uh, this is extremely high. It has the largest imports and has the largest exports. Uh, and uh, in many respects, uh, it, 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 China uh, is definitely our most lucrative market. Uh, one thing that is also absolutely true about China, it's not the Soviet Union. Uh, China sends its children to learn in Canada. The student population from China and Canada is extremely large. China invests in Canada. China trades very heavily with Canada. I mean, Canada is the 15th ranked country in terms of total trade with about $51 billion, $30 billion in terms of imports that we get from China and about $20 billion that we sell. And this trade could and should be larger. And there are lots of mutual benefits that could be accrued to this trade. Uh, the facts are very uh, credible and strong that the kind of exports we sell to the Chinese have really been very instrumental in ensuring, in generating, sustaining jobs and incomes for many Canadians. Our farmers depend very heavily on the Chinese market for canola, for soybeans, for wheat, for many other products. And the uh, exports in terms of uh, equipment, drilling for oil, and the uh, auto parts, the integration of the two economies is so massive, profound, uh, that the supply chains really crisscross the country and goes as far as Beijing and many of the Chinese cities. Uh, the story is, uh, why should this trade that we have garnered and nurtured in very substantive and very overt ways? We were, Canada, among the more ardent and more insistent on bringing Canada to the World Trade Organization in 2001. We wanted to tie Canada and China to a rules-based trading system and worked very heavily and very strongly to do so. One thing that has been on the top agenda of Canadian policymakers, Ray McLaren, who was the international trade minister in the 1990s in uh, Chrétien's uh, government, worked very diligently and passionately about increasing the options of Canada, about opening a diversified group of markets outside the United States. He called it the four pillars policy. Uh, he was very ardent and convinced that Canada could reduce that stranglehold that the American economy and its dominance have on Canada. And that China was the best and most lucrative and most credible outlet that we could really engage and profit from. And now, you know, this is what is really getting uh, absolutely uh, mind boggling. Uh, just about a week ago, China and 15, Pacific countries signed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which will bring about 30% and over 30% of the gross domestic product of the world in one trading block 
uh, the countries include a, a number of uh, uh, Canadian partners, such as New Zealand and uh, Australia and others. This is a time where Canada could benefit from that association. And this is exactly at the time when we are really putting the incarceration or the extradition uh, threat uh, standing in the way of increased trade, of sustaining more jobs, of liberating Canada from this heavy dependence on the United States uh, in increasing our relationships. That's not just purely resources, but also high technology. And it's not only trade, but also investment. Why are we putting all these things on the chopping block? And why can't we basically and fundamentally find ways and means that would allow us to do so? Look, one thing that is now absolutely true, there is a strong rivalry between the US and China. The US is trying in all its capacities and ways and means to frustrate the Chinese increased importance and increased presence in the world economy. The Chinese have enmeshed themselves in the global economy. They're not shying out. They want to be engaged more. And I would like to ask, you know, would China engage in trade and mutuality of interest that this trade and investment would bring about will be a more reasonable, a more open, a more concerned about its image and its perception in the rest of the world than a closed economy with a curtain on it, iron or otherwise. And that's exactly what we're saying here. We are pushing in cahoots with the Americans to put a curtain to lock China out of that international engagement and that it's in our interest, not only for trade, not for sustaining our jobs, not for increasing our capacity uh, to expand our opportunities uh, to sustain more jobs, better paying jobs, good jobs. It's also our obligation and our benefit and the world benefit is to make a more moderate China, a more open China, a more engaged China, a more respectful, for the respect that we give it. The respect is a two-way stream. You cannot expect the Chinese to respect human rights and the things we before if we don't show them the respect that they deserve and recognize what we can possibly gain from that mutuality. Uh, the uh, challenge is really there. And I think that uh, Canada is forfeiting. It's basically diverting the great chances that China had offered Canada and was really escalating, increasing, and opportunities mounting, escalating, cumulative. And we put them all on the chopping block. And this is a time, really, for statesmanship and for our ability to execute independence, not only economic, but political, where we show that we are a country that has all the sovereignty and all the respect for its obligations and for the treaties that they had uh, promulgated. WTO does not allow the kind of treatment we're doing to Huawei. And I think there are really major, profound mutuality of interest, responsibility towards a more peaceful world, and our complete and total devotion to protect our sovereignty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Atif. Um, and just thank you for highlighting the uh, just the great benefits that we would get from normalizing economic relationships um, and economic economic relations with China. And um, I learned a lot and look forward to hearing more from you in the Q&A. So our final speaker of the evening was meant to be Nikki Ashton, um, MP for Churchill, Kiwatnuk Aski. Um, she has been unable to make it at the last minute. Uh, we just found out before the event. Um, uh, she was also the official sponsor of the parliamentary petition E2857 to free Meng Wanzhou. She has sent along uh, what she had planned to say 
Um, so we have her speech and it's going to be read by Henry Evans Sabrinka, who initiated the parliamentary petition um, to free uh, Meng Wanzhou. So um, Henry, are you there? I'm here. Um, thank you for, uh, for having me speak. And uh, first of all, I want to say I'm speaking to you from the territory of uh, the Anishinaabe, traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee. I am in the territory of the uh, dish with one spoon uh, wampum. Um, Nikki, uh, something happened uh, last minute and Nikki's not able to be here, but uh, this is the, the, she asked me to bring this to you. Um, good evening, I would like to share a message of greetings tonight. By way of personal introduction, in addition to being a member of parliament, my background is in international relations in peace and conflict studies. I am concerned about what I see as a growing threat, the rising tide of Trump style xenophobia, and about what is increasingly becoming a new Cold War. I believe we need to talk about our role as Canadians, what we can and must do to make a difference. We are seeing rising xenophobia. Ironically, at the time when Donald Trump has just been defeated in the US, we have those in Canada that want to bring that same type of agenda. Red baiting, dog whistle politics. We saw this with the conservative leadership race, just how far this has gone. A leadership candidate who made one of the most blatantly racist accusations in this case against Canada's top public health official who is of Chinese background. That candidate not only was not disqualified from running, he now continues to sit as a Conservative Member of Parliament. What is also at stake is we are and who we are and what we are as a country. As Canadians, we need to be peace builders again in this world. We need to build on our history of peace building and peacekeeping. We need to work for peace, not just for the absence of war, but a positive piece of social economic justice and respect for human rights. It includes valuing diplomacy, engagement, and the re resolution of conflict. That values dialogue. That includes commitment to resolving bilateral and multilateral disputes. That recognizes that Canada can play a key role in terms of reducing much of the tension in the world that we need to be engaging each other as Canadians in reasoned debate on these very key issues. That was the spirit in which I agreed to bring forward the petition. I believe that we hopefully soon enter into the post COVID-19 world. Now more than ever, we need to be engaging with China and other countries around the world. Whatever our differences, we need to resolve them. We need to work globally for a post COVID-19 recovery. I am concerned that we are entering a new Cold War. At a time we at this at, at the time we need to be reminded of how the last Cold War that we came so close so many times to real conflict. How peace movements around the world, community grassroots voices of sanity played such a key role in pulling us back from the brink. Canada can play a role. Canada can play a key role. Let's do what we can. Let's fight back against the growing xenophobia. Let's put forward a vision of peace and diplomacy that sees Canada playing a key role as a peace builder in a post COVID-19 world. Thank you from Nikki Ashton. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henry, for representing Nikki. Uh, of course, we would have loved to see the real Nikki as I've seen uh, posted in the chat, but it's, um, it's wonderful that we were able to, to hear that message, um, that message of solidarity. So um, we've heard from all of our panelists and we're now moving into the Q&A portion of the evening. Um, the first part of the evening is going to be um, any uh, journalists that would like to ask questions. Um, I believe we have a question from journalist Daniel Z um, from the Canada Files. Um, Daniel, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Yeah, could you please ask your question either to um, an individual uh, or to uh, all of the panelists? So to all the panelists, my question is that just recently, we have seen the 
victory of the Joe Biden over Donald Trump, and there may be some hope that uh, things uh, may change change in the U U.S. But as Ashton would have stated, Canada has its own share of xenophobic politicians, and honestly, things. Things are necessarily getting better in the U.S. Joe Biden has campaigned on just as much xenophobia as Donald Trump, and it's what it's uh, it may be that he may also view the growing economic and social rights of China as uh, growing economic and social rights of China as a threat to U.S. power and the desire to maintain a. Unipolar U.S. world rather than a multipolar one, which, as a thief, our speaker esteemed speaker points out, would have allowed that will allow everyone to have various opportunities of development on the world stage, and allow everyone to learn from each other and foster diplomacy. So, so the question is: To do you see any sort of Change in the relate in in how Biden would approach the case of Meng Wanzhou, and how would uh, and uh, how should we advocating for peace between Canada and China rather than this saber rattling that just making our nations worse? How should we as Canadians respond to a Biden administration? How it Foreign policy with China would be like, particularly since they Biden is just as responsible for like stoking xenophobia in a in an attempt to one up Trump rather than pushing forward anything progressive or diplomatic. Thank you so much, Daniel, for your question. Uh, uh, Kathy, I see your hand up. You, you'll need to unmute yourself. There we go. Uh, I think the, uh, no, you can hear me all right? Yeah, thank you. I uh, think that uh, that's a very interesting question, but I think uh, for Canadians, whoever is in the White House is, uh, while certainly not irrelevant to us, I think that we have to look at Canadian history uh, for uh, uh, our guidance. And we were the first country in uh, the Western Hemisphere to uh, recognize China. That was in 1970. And uh, if we uh, were prepared to do that then, we should certainly be prepared to have an independent foreign policy today. Uh, what Mr. Biden does is certainly not irrelevant but I think that we need to do something independently and we should be doing that uh, now and uh, certainly not waiting for Mr. Biden to try and uh, bail us out. Uh, we should uh, simply release uh, Meng Wanzhou and uh, not wait for Mr. Biden uh, or, or worry about an interregnum period uh, with uh, Mr. Trump uh, still being uh, in, technically in power. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. John, I see your hand up. You'll just need to unmute yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, well, I had the same point to make about Canada having an independent foreign policy. So I won't repeat what Kathy said, except that we are part of the change. This organization, this meeting tonight is part of the change. And we have judges read newspapers, judges listen to media, and our work is also to support her in court because it does not stand up. And this is why our fight for an independent foreign policy must be related to the maintenance of this coalition, support for the defense, the, dem the action, which I think you're going to talk about, I'm not going to announce it. There's a secret action next week, uh, which we'll talk about it. And obviously to plan uh, future events. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Is there anyone else on at Atif? It's just going to take World Beyond the uh, organizers a second to unmute you. Actually, Atif, I think you might need to unmute yourself. You're still on mute. We can't hear your. Yeah. Okay, now, all right. I, I want to echo what my colleagues have already mentioned that the, the issue is to have an independent. Canadian foreign policy, regardless of who is in the White House, how important the White House is to our uh, affairs. Uh, the issue here is, and that's what's worrying me, is that there will be differences in style, not in substance, between Biden and Trump. And that could be even worse and could be a subtle way of doing the same thing, but probably greater harm because it's not as abrasive or as arrogant as the way Trump has handled the things. Uh, Paul. Yeah, a little back and forth there with the mute, unmute, being allowed <laughs> to mute. I could see how Atif got tripped up. Um, yeah, as I've said before, clearly Canada needs its own independent foreign policy. And we need to work on being a diplomatic nation that works towards solving problems in the world. And in terms of Sinophobia, the, the issues that have come up around this are extremely disturbing and, and including around the COVID-19 um, pandemic, the, the Sinophobia that's reared its ugly head from that is highly problematic. With uh, Joe Biden in the president's seat, the American foreign policy isn't uh, necessarily driven by the president, although we've seen a very bellicose and, uh, um, yeah, not evidence-based president in, in that chair. And I think that uh, Joe Biden may go back to uh, doing what Obama did with the Iran nuclear deal, and he will be more receptive to uh, Canada asking to get these, this extradition uh, thrown out. Um, I think he'll, he will be more receptive to, to uh, our Canadian prime minister than, um, than Trump has been. I think Trump listens to his own, his own uh, voice in his head. Uh, the unmute button. So, um... <laughs> The, uh, the, the next question is actually from, um, thank you so much, Daniel, for your question. That was excellent. The next question is from Chris Black from the um, Canadian Peace Congress, who's um, gonna give us a little bit of a call to action. And then he's going to, to pose the first of the audience questions. And then I'm gonna start going through the questions that have been given to me by various audience members, both in advance of and during the course of uh, of this webinar. So Chris, are you there? Yes, but I have not got a question. I'm gonna make a short statement. <clears throat> the Canadian Peace Congress, which has been active in the campaign for world peace since 1947, welcomes the call for the release of Meng Wanzhou, who is held hostage by Canada under legal pretexts in order to use her to pressure China to bend to the will of the United States. We note, as many others have said in this meeting, that China is not the only target of this exercise. Iran is also important in this arrest because Canada, by illegally arresting and detaining Meng, is taking part in enforcing the illegal sanctions imposed by the United States on Iran. The Canadian, American, and Chinese people have in common a desire to avoid war at all costs. People all over the world want to live in peace, not in an atmosphere of confrontation and threat of war. The forces of Western imperialism want to demolish this vision for a just and peaceful world, to create their new world order, an American world order, which can only lead to war war. Tragically, the United States and Canada and their allies have been waging an increasingly belligerent hybrid war against China, whose tactics include uh, unprovoked arrest of Meng Wanzhou, uh, illegal actions against Huawei and TikTok and other high-tech companies, dangerous military operations in the East China Sea and the Straits of Taiwan to provoke and encircle China 
and the near constant barrage of Western supremacist and racist propaganda against China in almost all the Western media. A robust and effective peace movement is needed to counter the increasingly hostile actions of United States and NATO imperialism. The Canadian Peace Congress calls on working people across Canada to become involved in the peace and solidarity movement to stand up against the reactionary forces in this country who are leading us towards catastrophe. Only a strong and active peace movement can compel the Canadian government to reestablish friendly and respectful relations with China and pursue a foreign policy of peace cooperation and mutual respect. Finally, the Congress views the NATO alliance as a trap for Canada, an alliance that acts against and negates the UN Charter. It is a fundamentally aggressive alliance controlled by the US for US interests. This organization has committed the supreme war crime of aggression against countries from Europe to the Middle East and is increasingly bellicose and oriented towards great power conflict with emerging world powers such as Russia and China. Canada, as many people have said, must chart its own path forward and pursue an agenda of peace and prosperity for all its citizens, its sovereign First Nations, and all nations in the world. And to ensure that course is followed, must leave all military alliances and as a further sign of its goodwill, commit to sign the Treaty on the Elimination of Nuclear Weapons. We welcome this event and the planned day of action, which we support and will join. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that very strong message, uh, Chris. I see a lot of support for, for your message in the chat. Um, so we're now moving on to the Q&A from the audience. Uh, and we only have about half an hour before this meeting is officially over. So we'll just get through as many questions as, as we can. And thank you for submitting them. If you have any more, put them in the chat. This is, uh, this is your last chance to get them in there. So. The first question that we have, uh, could a Atif or others speak about how the, Meng, the Hmong arrest is part of weakening Huawei and the company's role in Canada and globally as one of the only successful high-tech companies? Atif, could you uh, answer this first? I, I mean, there is no question about it here that uh, at the heart of uh, this uh, crisis we have is not the persona, persona of uh, Wang Zhou. It's the economic rivalry between the two largest and most competitive economy for dominance and for uh, stature in the world economy. Uh, Huawei as a technology is one of the instruments uh, that the U.S. sees China taking precedence and leading uh, in the 5G generation ahead of others. So to a great extent, uh, any emasculation, any curtailment, any thwarting of the growth and importance of Huawei is seen as diminishing the competitive advantages of China. And there is no doubt in my mind here that uh, if this rivalry was not at the heart of all these uh, issues and complexities and difficulties, uh, there would not be a, an issue of uh, extradition uh, of Meng Zhu or any of the things that we are seeing. So particularly here relevant is this rivalry, this uh, increased, intense, and in many respects in going into the unacceptable way. I mean, under w WTO, uh, every corporation should be treated in every market as if it's a national corporation and there should be no discrimination against this. So now they're invoking the exception to the WTO, which is national security without proof, as uh, has been mentioned by our colleagues, know that uh, many countries have looked to see if the technology is giving the Chinese intelligence capacities in other places. So all what we are really seeing here is the extent to which China is accepted uh, in, in any way or shape or form, uh, as a world economic power and the extent to which the United States is willing to yield some position, some importance, some space, some recognition 
of China. Thank you. Thank you so much, Atif. Is there anyone else on our panel who'd like to, uh, to answer that question? Having some trouble seeing whether there's thumbs up. So uh, you can either speak up or I'll move, I'll move on to the next question. All right. So the next question that we have, um, well, uh, there's been quite a few questions for Paul. Um, there's, there's actually lots of criticism in the chat about the, the position that you had put forward. Um, and so the first question is, you supported the Conservatives motion in the House of Commons last week that was highly critical of China. Are you concerned about aligning with the Conservatives' Sinophobic campaign? That's the first half of the question. And then sort of linked to that, you talk about protecting Canada's extradition system, but are missing the bigger picture of the injustice of, tr of the Trump case. The justice minister has the ability to step in at any time for a reason, question mark. So those are for, for you, Paul, but of course, anyone else can jump in um, and, uh, and respond uh, to that as well. Well, <clears throat> I supported the conservative motion for a number of reasons. and, and uh, because I've heard from people, ch Chinese people in this country who've been threatened by, by the Chinese government for their activism. I just want to <clears throat> quote something because, you know, people are making these equations. I want to quote Noam, Noam Chomsky here. He's a rightly world famous for being a preeminent critic of the U.S. empire and of capitalism. Yet he does not spare China of his, of his criticism, criticism. He doesn't fall prey to the need to make a false choice between China and the US, one good and one being bad. Speaking about tech companies uh, surveilling into our lives, Norm Chomsky had this to say, if we allow huge tech companies, the state, to control our lives, that's what will happen. They'll turn it into something like China, where you have a credit card system and in some cities you get a certain amount of credits there's face recognition technology all over the place and everything you do gets monitored. So, you know, Noam Chomsky is not a, not a, uh, a right winger, I'd say. Edward Snowden also said he became aware of China's surveillance of private communications and was utterly mind boggled. He was initially so impressed by the system's sheer achievement and audacity that I almost forgot to be appalled by its totalitarian controls, he said. So, you know, there are, there are legitimate concerns about China. There's legitimate concerns about uh, the way our data is mined by Google, by Facebook, uh, Cambridge Analytica. Um, so there's, you know, there's concerns on both sides. And I think uh, taking a reasonable approach in, uh, is, is important. You can't just uh, uh, have, you know, white hat, black hat, uh, spy versus spy, and one's a good guy and one's a bad guy. It's there, we, these are two uh, um, large companies or countries that are vying for, for uh, you know, global uh, influence. And we've had a long period of, of American imperialism and can, Canada is involved in imperialism as well through our mining companies and, and um, other aspects of how we join, you know, NATO regime change uh, campaigns. So, you know, it's not a, there's nothing black and white about this. There's a lot of shades of gray. And I'm concerned about a lot of things that, that are done on this planet. And so I did vote for that, uh, for that motion. I didn't agree with everything in the motion, but I agreed enough with what was in there that uh, I voted for it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Is there anyone else, um, any of the other panelists that would like to, to speak to this question at all? And just quite clearly, I do not support any kind of cold war. I've been a peace activist for a good chunk of my life. And I've, uh, you know, worked on in the in the peace movement and as a human rights observer, you know, with a, in Chiapas, as a labor observer in Guatemala, you know, at sweatshops and working with labor activists in places like that. And, it, you know, we need to work towards changing the world through diplomacy. 
I'd like to know what this group would is going to do about Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, because you know one of my constituents is a friend of Michael Spavor, and he would like to know, you know, when when he's going to be released, and uh, and that is why I've spoken out on this issue, and I think people need to to bring that question, you know, to to China. Why why are you holding these two men, and why, when are you going to release them? Thank, thank you, Paul. I mean, I think we, we hold you in high esteem and this is why these, uh, these hard questions, you know, uh, are, are, are posed. So uh, is there anyone else on the panel that would like to ask, uh, would like to respond to this? Um, sorry, you're all itty bitty tiny little people. I'm just looking around. All right, I'm gonna move on. Okay, so the next question that we have uh, is, uh, I think from Bruce, and the question is, in, in, 1990, in 1999, the Extradition Act was amended to include a, a, include a specific provision that provides the Federal Minister of Justice the power to intervene in an extradition at any point during the judicial, judicial phase. Louise Arbour and, an, and numerous other former diplomats have called on Lametti to put an end to the charade, but he won't. Do you think the Prime Minister's office is blocking it? Note the difference between former minister Jody Wislon Raybald's resistance and Lametti's compliance. So this question is for anyone on the panel. John. I'm trying to, yeah. Well, I, I'm, I guess, one of the lawyer on this one. Um, there's a unilateral right under section 23 to put an end to this process. There is clearly a division among certain parts of the Canadian, how do you call it, elite, liberal elite, the liberal power, power in Canada, which is, has a lot of power. And I think it's a reflection of the interest in Canada to do business with China. And um, well, we're going to go to Mr. Lametti's office next uh, Tuesday on the 1st of December to try and convince him to do this. No, I'm, I'm joking a bit, but uh, this is part of our way out. It may be a way out, um, the petition in the House of Commons. Uh, so there is, Canada can, can drop this anytime and this is what should be done. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, John. Um, anyone else on our panel that's interested in taking, uh, taking this question? All right, I'm gonna move on to the next question. Um, so this one is for, uh, seems to be directed at uh, Chief Kaborsi, but also to anyone else on the panel. Um, do you believe the USMC trade provision regarding Canada um, having to allow the US to review any free trade agreement made with a non-market economy was directly aimed at China? And if so, do you think Christian Freeland's ideological commitment to anti-socialism informed it. Atif, this is for Atif. Uh, we can't hear you. I think you're still muted. All right, now. Okay, yeah, there is a provision in the USMCA that replaced NAFTA and before it in NAFTA that any country which is party to this agreement cannot hold any agreements or other trade things with other parties without referring back to the original group. In some sense, hands of Canada are tied in this trade arrangement. I'm surprised that they had accepted this. And what worries me here is that this provision or this statement or this article is going to constrain the ability of Canada to freely deal with other countries. And I am convinced that even in the absence of all these things, as long as we remain so mired in this heavy dependence on an exclusive market, our options, our ability to conduct free economic and political policies uh, will remain constrained. 
Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to try uh, taking this question? Any of our panelists? Paul. Yeah, so that, that provision in the trade agreement is highly problematic. Um, you know, NAFTA was set up with a, with, um, a six month notice uh, for a get up, get out clause. And uh, we went through the process of negotiating uh, this agreement with, with Donald Trump. And uh, one of the things that we did get rid of in that agreement was the investor state dispute settlements. And we have investor state dispute settlements in uh, a whole raft of international trade agreements. And what those dispute settlements allow corporations to do is to sue our government for laws and policies that get in the way of their, of their profits. And under NAFTA, we, as, a, as a developed country, we were sued more than any other developed country. We use investor state dispute settlements to go after the who's who of, of uh, developing countries through FIPA agreements, the Foreign Investment Prom Promotion and Protection Agreements. And we've signed those. We've got about 45 of them that have been signed. And we use those FIPA agreements to mostly our mining and extraction com companies to go after developing uh, lower income uh, countries to, to force our extraction projects. Now we've signed a, a, a FIPA agreement, the conservative, the Harper conservative government negotiated this agreement and they didn't bring it to parliament for ratification. And it was passed through an order in council the FIPA Foreign Investment Promotion and Protection Agreement, it lasts for 15 years, 15 years before we can, we can uh, pull out of it. And after that, it sits in place for another year and any Chinese corporation, state owned or not, that is invested in Canada can keep that investment in place and be protected by that investor state dispute settlement for another 15 years, for a total of 31 years. And so this is, you know, one of the things that I'm very concerned about is giving, uh, you know, corporations in China, state-owned corporations, the ability to challenge our laws and policies in this country and use investor state dispute settlement provisions in secretive tribunals to extract the wealth of Canadians through through uh, um, you know tribunal decisions and take taxpayers' money when they don't get what they want, whether that's uh, you know they want to extract uh, Sinopec and and uh, PetroChina have invested a huge amount of money into the oil sands, and that's probably why we bought a pipeline because we're being threatened by this Canada-China FIPA. We have uh, um, LNG Canada, we're fracking the hell out of the Northwest of British Columbia for LNG Canada, which has nothing to do with Canada. It is three state-owned corporations, PetroChina being one of them, Petronas another, uh, Korea Gas, Mitsubishi from Japan, which is a private corporation and Shell Canada. And they all have these investor state dispute settlements in them, but the, the, the one with the Canada-China FIPA is an outrageous one. And when that agreement was locked in, the, the trade between Canada and China, Canada has opened itself up to, to, to trade through uh, all the agreements that it has already signed. And China was able to lock in its discrimination in that process. And anybody that wants to you know, verify that information, uh, Gus Van Harten, who is a trade uh, ex expert, a lawyer and a teacher at Osgoode Hall in, in Toronto, has written a very good expose about this called Sold Down the Yangtze River. And you can read his academic papers about how this agreement is so lopsided and put us in this terrible position. So we have problems with trade with the United States and in, in these agreements that we're locked into and with the TPP and other agreements, and we are locked into this Canada-China FIPA for the, for in that case, you know, nobody cared about FIPAs be, before when we were assigning them with the who's who of uh, lower income countries and our mining companies and extraction companies were using this to, to uh, you know, to get what they wanted. Nobody was concerned about it until we signed one with China. Thank you, Paul. Does anyone else want to weigh in on that before we move on to the next question? Okay. 
Um, all right, so the next question that we have um, is, could John or others give more detail on how US sanctions are illegitimate or imperialistic? John, let's start with you. Well, <clears throat> this is uh, related to the comprehensive agreement signed in 2015, which Donald Trump uh, imposed, uh, withdrew from as he promised in his election. And he is, uh, <clears throat> the whole question of <laughs> economic sanctions in international law is a very hot one because it's a way of waging war without guns. It, it imposes social conditions, impossible situations on countries such as Iran, such as Venezuela, and it's a way for the dominant countries to intimidate many countries in the world. For example, Europe is only barely trading with Iran. I don't have all the figures because there's a little bit of business going on between, for example, Germany and Iran, but these countries are all terrified that if they deal with Iran, um, even though it's illegal, because they all uh, they have, they all have an agreement, they're bound by this comprehensive uh, agreement signed in 2015. But if they dare deal with Iran, they can undergo terrible economic sanctions by this country, the U.S., which even though it's in decline, is still somewhat powerful and tongue in cheek. So that's part of the the problem of economic sanctions, which is. Um, it's it, it instead of using guns, they use economy, and they've done it. They did it in Iraq in the 1990s. They've done it. It's one of the major arms of the U.S. Uh, right now, and it's a thing which we have to face. And Canada is also following in and in imposing sanctions on countries. And so now I'm going beyond China and Iran when I when I say that. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, actually, KJ is here. We um, I couldn't see him because of the, the camera issues, but uh, could uh, are you KJ? Is it yes. possible to unmute? Yes, thank you. Yes, I would like to uh, respond to uh, Paul Manley. And I have been sitting here listening carefully and what strikes me is that Mr. Manley is incapable of listening. Uh, many of us have already said that Canada's, uh, Canada is not tied. Section 23 of the Canadian Extradition Act gives the government the authority to terminate this case at any time. It's unclear to me why Mr. Manley keeps on repeating the lie that he cannot, that we cannot act. And I have said in my own presentation, no one who tells you that Canada's hands are legally tied is telling you the truth. So I'm going to request that Mr. Manley, please stop lying. Please stop virtue signaling. Please stop uh, with your sinophobia and your China bashing. Everything you've said so far is untrue and you don't have proof. If there were proof, we would have already seen it. I am a disinterested party, but there is no proof of any of the allegations that you are making about China. You may be referring to the lies spread by Adrian Zenz or the World Uyghur Congress funded by the NED, but these do not rise to a level of proof. You have to stop lying and spreading this propaganda. Otherwise, you, sir, are guilty of fanning the flames of sinophobia 
and creating harm and pain and damage to the Chinese communities who are suffering from this incredible racism. I'm going to say one more thing, sir. You throw the word genocide out. But let me tell you something, sir. I come from a country where your troops committed genocide on my people. I have two family members who were killed. I have two family members who were imprisoned and tortured. I do not know whereby you gain the authority to throw out these cheap words with no moral backing and your simple virtue signaling, your lies, your disdain for the people and your failure, your fundamental failure to listen to people is beyond comprehension. Thank you. Okay, um, I just wanna jump in quickly. Um, thank you, KJ, for your comments. I also just, you know, just wanna reiterate that all the panelists who've come out today, um, you know, I think have come here in, in good faith and, you know, to whatever extent, if we can focus our comments on, you know, on, on not necessarily on the individual intentions, but, you know, on, on the, on, on, on the words that we're saying, that would, that would be great. But, uh, but, I, but I understand that, I understand also um, where you're coming from um, and, the, and the personal message that you're communicating. But um, uh, so and we're just gonna move on. Um, we only have five more minutes. Can I just respond to that? Because yeah. I never used the word genocide once, KJ. I'd really like to know what you've done to get Michael Spavor or Michael Korvrig out of, uh, out of prison. And I just want to read to you what Amnesty International says on the Uyghurs. And, and I don't think that they're an imperialist organization. They look at human rights abuses everywhere, including right here in Canada and in the United States. And Amnesty International said the fate of an estimated up to 1 million people is unknown. And most of the detainees families have been kept in the dark. China has intensified its campaign of mass internment, intrusive surveillance, political indoctrination, and forced cultural assimilation against the region's Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and other predominantly Muslim ethnic groups. Amnesty International has interviewed more than 100 people outside of China whose relatives in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region are still missing as well as individuals who said they were tortured while in detention camps there. This is not coming from some imperialist organization. This is coming from Amnesty International, which has a reputation of looking at human rights around the planet and looking at what American imperialism has done in different parts of the planet. They are a very credible organization. And I happen to, to feel that uh, the evidence that they have gathered is credible. So I have never mentioned genocide, and I would like to see what you're going to do, KJ, about getting Mr. Kovrig and Mr. Spavor out of prison. I stand by what I've said. Kathy? There. Yeah, I, I just like to say that uh, if we get back to the topic, if uh, Ma Guangzhou is released, it's fairly apparent, I think, to nearly all Canadians that the two Michaels will be released. Obviously, they were imprisoned in response. And if Ma Guangzhou is released and allowed to go back to China, I'm sure the two Michaels will be here in no time. And uh, that's certainly what at least one of the Michaels spouses is calling for. And I think we should listen to her as a spouse who is concerned about her husband. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy, for that intervention. So we have, we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to come to the end of the questions very soon. I have um, perhaps the last question here. Um, 
yeah, we'll see how long it takes to answer this. The Canadian government repeats having to maintain the rule of law as an excuse to not intervene in the extradition process. Have any of the six nations that rejected the US extradition requests faced any penalties for doing so or made any statements on this rule of law? And this is, uh, this is directed to all panelists. John. I don't, we don't know whether these countries were actually punished or criticized by the US. We, we don't know about that. But the rule of law is a big hoax. Canada always talks about rule based relationships. But if they allow the kind of evidence and procedure being done by our authorities, Canadian Border Services, RCMP, the Canadian Political Police, uh, this is unacceptable. And this is why all of us, including the parliamentarians, have to criticize the Canadian police authorities, government, and when I talk about that includes border services. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else uh, that wants to respond to that that question? Okay, um, and then we have uh, maybe I'll just end with this question. We have um, we have a question from the Voice of Concern Chinese Canadians. Does anyone have a prediction if President Elect Joe Biden would let Canada off the hook to release uh, Ms. Meng? Crystal Ball, anyone? Kathy. Well, uh, given there still are dozens of people in the Guantanamo uh, detention facility in Cuba, I think that we shouldn't hold our breaths, uh, even though it's a democratic president. Uh, but uh, I'll just say again, uh, I don't think we can rely on, uh, on Joe Biden. Uh, he'll do his, whatever makes sense for the Americans. And I think what we have to do is what makes sense for Canada and have an independent foreign policy and uh, simply take the action to release Meng Wanzhou. And um, when we reassert ourselves with an independent foreign policy, I think that we can all stand uh, prouder and taller as Canadians. Absolutely. Thank you. Is there, uh, is there anyone else on the panel that would like to uh, respond to, to that question? Okay. All right. Wow. Okay. Well, what an evening. Um, thank you all so much for sticking it out. It's been two hours. Um, it's certainly been a vibrant evening. Um, I know that I have learned um, a heck of a lot. And I'm just, I'm so grateful to all of our panelists for being here, to the journalists, to Chris um, for his quest, for his, uh, for his statement. Um, and, you know, that's all the time that we have today. But, um, you know, just want to say thank you so much to our panelists, to Nikki, to KJ, to Paul, to Kathy, Atif, John, for sharing your insights, your knowledge. Um, to the audience for your excellent questions and for your lively participation. I also want to thank the organizers of the uh, event, of course, the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War, who are leading the charge on the campaign to free uh, Meng Wanzhou, uh, World Beyond War, who've done all the tech today that you're seeing and have just made this flow so smoothly um, and have done heavy promotion to make this event a reality, thanks to the Canadian Peace Congress, to Just Peace Advocates, for co-presenting and also to Pivot for Peace for endorsing event, uh, for endorsing this event. You can find out more about the Foreign Policy Institute where I work and the campaign for a fundamental reassessment of Canadian foreign policy at foreignpolicy.ca. And of course, the most important thing is to take action. So sign the House of Commons petition to free Meng Wanzhou. This is in the chat. Um, you can find it, Google it if you can't see it in the chat. Um, or if you're watching this uh, after on Facebook Live, 
Um, there's also an action network tool that allows you to email all your MPs at once to ask them to work towards freeing Meng Wanzhou. Um, find out more and support all of the groups that organize this event and, and the cross country day of action to free Meng Wanzhou, which was really the inspiration for this event. And you can see, um, you can see the chat um, for the dates, locations, and you can also find them on the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the Wars website. Again, that's the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the Wars website. So I'm wishing you all a beautiful evening. That's it for our program today. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here.